Um, Peter, talk a little bit about these water pan paintings. One of them you did in Provincetown. They, I did them both in Provincetown. Oh, okay. And this one was a, a summer of 74. At the end, when everyone was gone, I could have some privacy and concentration. And I picked a, I started, I think, in late August. <clears throat> and it was in this place that nobody painted in the afternoon. School was really crowded. So I picked it as nobody was there. And I thought, well, what if I tackle the full light problem? Um, so at the time, I was inspired by a painting that Henry had done of a Chianti bottle on a table that John Eversberger has. I love that painting and the way he did that Chianti bottle. So there was a Chianti bottle on the shelf at the school. So I went through my Chianti bottle period. <laughs> and so, and I'd collected ginger jars. I was into the ginger jar thing because of Henry painting ginger jars and they were just absolutely beautiful. And of course the Mexican glass from the Mexican shop down the street. We'd go there first thing when I got to the when I got to P Town before everybody bought the other stuff up. So I set these up in a water pan in front of this dead cherry tree trunk, poison ivy, and great uh, uh, woodbine vine, and um, decided I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle full light. I started this with what we used to call nuking it, which was full strength cadmium colors almost out of the tube on the light planes just to get the, get the key and get the strength of it, and then worked on it for probably a month or so, and, and, and getting to the point where my mind could accept starting to work in cooler, duller, duller off notes, colors with no names, and earth, earth pinks and earth colors, and still have it look like light on the surface. Of course, the cast shadow makes this look like warm light. But the cast shadow colors are not that cool. It's all relative. These are odd, odd colors, but um, they look cool in that relationship. But if you put them against cooler colors, they're really kind of warm. So anyway, it's all relative. This one I did the following summer, and these are those elephant ears or uh, Japanese knotweed that we used to have in the other yard across the street. But uh, I set this up, and it was kind of hazy mornings. And uh, so I wanted, I wanted to see what I could do with that. And so I got this far again, the Chianti bottle theme, in in water. Um, it was fun. So, oh, uh, Peter. Yep. Uh, it looks so finished, even though it's kind of halfway between major variations and the beginning right. of minor variations. When a painting really has its structural strength. Right. The masses, the sum total of the masses showing the light key and developed enough so that you don't really need all that much. It will still carry. The strength of the masses will carry, but then when you look closer, the minor variations, even if they're not fully developed, will, will also hold in their place, but also be descriptive of what you're doing. And it's, it's being able to juggle Juggle those notes so you hold them in the mass, but you got variety within the mass too. Because you model form, every plane change is a color change, and no no color repeats itself. They're different. All the whole painting's different. This is probably the most difficult kind of painting anyone ever could tackle. Henry's approach to painting. It's so demanding. It's like being a concert violinist and you cannot miss a note. If you're playing a concerto, you got to hit every note right on. These paintings are nothing more than the same thing, playing a playing a concerto with paint. And he, this was so demanding, and I think the reason that people didn't pursue it as far as they could is because it's so demanding. It requires so much time, so much energy and effort, and you can't have distractions. I was young then. I was loose. I wasn't committed in a relationship. I wasn't married. Uh, I didn't have an apartment. I was just a vagabond, but I focused all of my time and energy on painting like an obsession to see what I could do, and I tried to do it as good as I can so Henry wouldn't yell at me because he used to yell at people, and I didn't want to get yelled at because he could be brutal. So I tried to behave myself and do what was, I was supposed to do and also sweep out the studio and put the garbage out and keep everything all in good shape, too. Just, well, well, the people don't understand the level of mental concentration and how that is 
so intense that it's almost as bad as any physical effort you had to put out anywhere. Oh yeah, and it's mentally exhausting maintaining that focus and the energy it takes and constantly scanning your eye and constantly asking questions and analyzing the whole thing, but you're enjoying it too, so you've got to be excited. You know, you're having good time. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. It had to hold my interest, and I had to be excited about it. I wouldn't paint something if I wasn't if somehow uh, excited about it. I, would, I didn't want to be perfunctory. I didn't just want to go through the motions and have no feeling at all. I always painted stuff that I was interested in, and usually there was a problem I was working on that I wanted to solve. Full light, modeling objects in full light, and also always constantly Henry would make little comments about composition and so trying to work those in and learn what he was trying to say. Spacing, all your spacing should be different, not repeat the same spacing in your compositions. Eyes follow lines, watch your lines and how they, how they interrelate. You don't want a line taking you out of the painting, you want to keep the eye in the painting going around. Where does your eye enter? How does it go through the painting and come back out and then go back in? So it's an awful lot to think about. But after a while, it almost becomes automatic. You should be able to model color objects in color automatically without even thinking about it. But that, in the beginning, is a very conscious, deliberate effort. And it takes an awful lot of time and a lot of painting and a lot of energy. I never was big on producing quantity because when I did the studies, I was interested in quality. So somebody might do 10 or 20 paintings to my, my one, but in that one painting, I would try to push and understand what it was that, it, that needed to be worked on instead of just doing a whole bunch of paintings and not working really on anything except a basic start. Yeah, I did a lot of starts too, but that's only the beginning. Well, well, well Peter, that's like the question that we get from people about the difference between study and painting or how you finish something and what you're saying is that a study organically and naturally evolves into right. a finished painting if you work right. on it long enough. Which is what this is. This is a study. A study that I pushed and so then it becomes what you call a painting. But I thought about in the beginning a study but also the study of composition so that it had an arrangement. I wasn't just putting a bunch of stuff together without any thought. I spent time in the beginning before I painted it to set it all up in my mind so that when I went to paint it, it was already painted. I just had to transfer the painting in my mind that <laughs> I was seeing as I was looking at it onto the masonite. One thing that we haven't talked about is before I was uh, with Henry, I had studied with two of Henry's students who were prominent, successful, professional painters in their own right. Richard Goetz, who was landscape and still life and taught that at Malden Bridge, and Betty Warren, which was portrait and figure, and she taught drawing too. And without that foundation, I wouldn't have gotten nearly as much from Henry as I did because I already had an understanding of a lot of the basics that Henry talked about but didn't necessarily focus on too much and didn't demonstrate. He demonstrated in his paintings, but if he didn't know that, you wouldn't have known what the heck he was doing. But I could see it in his paintings of what he, what Henry, uh, what, what Betty Warren had been teaching me, planes, color planes in drawing, value planes in charcoal, but always thinking about the planes and the color, not to the degree Henry taught, but always thinking in terms of color um, and we did figure and, and uh, portrait studies in the mornings in the studio doing that. And then with Richard Goetz, he emphasized composition right off the bat. So I learned about arrangement from Richard Goetz too. And um, he was also taught technique, little tricks like making a viewfinder when you're starting out and you're looking through your, your viewfinder and proportion of your painting to get an idea of how things line up in your composition. Henry never talked about that kind of thing, but he was big into technique. He was a, a technician, so he would give little tips about painting. A lot of the stuff I never did, he was into dry brush and all and scumbling. I learned from Henry just direct painting with a knife. Betty had us painting with a knife too. We did paint with brushes, 
but also Betty advocated using a knife. And I did some knife work at Malden Bridge, but it was awkward and clumsy. And then when I went to Provincetown, it was like, no brushes, do away with the brushes. You got All you got is a knife. And it's like you feel like a, a savage with this barbaric tool. But after a summer, you really get to get used to it. Then you can't see going back to a brush because the knife becomes so precise. You can control the color so much better with a knife and really get those subtle differences and the clarity so that every note is visible and rings on its own, but they're all together related. Whereas with a brush, it can be blurry and slur, slur together, be kind of fuzzy. You've got to have a lot of brushes to keep your colors clean. You've got to have a, uh, mineral spirits or something to constantly wash them out, which is a pain in the neck. So the knife really, after a while, is much easier, much simpler than, uh, than all, doing all the other stuff. Well, but I did do some demos in brushes because they are faster. And uh, yeah. people want to get res see results when you do a demo <laughs> in front of a, an art group. It's a bunch of amateurs, and they want things to, to look like a photograph because that's what basically you just sit and copy pictures. Well, well, talk about your good luck of running into Glenn Graffham at school. Well, yeah. When I first went up to, to uh, Provincetown, Glenn was living in the class studio. He was sort of like what you would call the class monitor. And he, he was right there, and we went up early before uh, July 4th. We went up in June. And Glenn is there, and we're doing block studies. And Glenn would make these little cutting remarks like, you think that's sunny? That's not sunny. <laughs> you don't have the sun. You know, we'd go out there, and, oh, geez, you know. Finally, I did one. It was like cadmium colors on fire. And he goes, yeah, that looks sunny, finally. You know, that's a sunny one. But Glenn was uh, influenced by Charlie Miller. He had painted with Charlie for two winters, and also when Charlie was in Provincetown in the, in the class. And so Glenn learned about modeling and color, which Henry also was working on at that time. So Glenn informed me and made me aware of modeling much more than Henry. I learned more from Glenn that first summer, actually, than I did from, uh, from Henry. And he pointed things out, like get an object to lay on a tabletop, get that tabletop to, to recede, you know, get that edge to turn, and, and, and really study modeling. Betty talked about it somewhat, but Glenn even pushed it further in my mind so I had a better understanding so that I had problems that I could work on. Do a solid object, do a, do a, a glossy, uh, a reflective object and see if you can get to look around with reflections. Do glass. Glass is like painting water. Get the, get the outside surface round but also indicate the backside of it and the reflections of it but hold it all in its planes and masses so that it looks like glass with light on it hitting the outside surface with reflections. Well, it it's a hell been, of a problem, but it's great. It's it a lot of fun. It must have been really helpful that Glenn was doing solid modeling problems, right. so you had that example. Yep, yep. I have studies of Glenn's here. Want me to pull them out? We could, yeah. We could pull out some of Glenn's studies. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, now i got to think now where'd I put them. Um, they're in these drawers because um, I have some of his indoor, uh, indoor studies his outdoor studies. Um, uh, speaking of Glenn Grafham, I think you have some of his early study studies here, don't you? Yes, I do. And um, they were left at the school. When he left, he used to live in a loft. So when uh, Glenn left, he left behind a whole bunch of stuff, and I was a scavenger always, so I picked them all up and brought them back here. When I first arrived in P-Town in the June, the weather was uh, bad outside, so Glenn had started this in the class studio. I think he worked on this twice. And um, when I saw him working, I thought, now this guy really knows what he's doing. This shit and I don't know anything I'm just a raw I'm going to I'm going to have the attitude of I don't know a thing even though I'd studied three summers at Malden Bridge with Betty Warren and Dick Getz I don't know anything so just shut up and listen and look pay attention so I saw Glenn do this and I thought man this guy knows what the hell he's doing all these beautiful off notes and typical Glenn colors which Tommy has inform me our Charlie Miller <laughs> Charlie Miller influence because Glenn painted with Charlie Miller here's a, a, a start 
Oh, there's that other one. A sunlight start he had done up in, uh, that, I think it was his last summer. And he was there about five summers. That bottle's really got some killer notes on it. Yep. Very transparent. Yep. Another start. Classic Glenn Grafham notes. Yep. And then of course Glenn did more starts that he would develop when he was with Charlie Miller and the focus was on modeling and color in a light key. And these are good examples of the planes of color in the mass in the light key. There's another one. He got his money's worth out of the mace knight and used both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yep. But when you do indoor painting, you get into all kinds of beautiful, weird colors that you don't really, maybe you'd see them outside in the gray day, but indoors, where it's more um, easy to study over a period of time, length of time, it's really fun to explore those notes. There's the light on it better. Yep. Colors with no name, all over the place. That's the whole idea, folks. Here's another one that ended up in one of Henry's paintings in the background of a still life, and you can see this rose-colored spout in the in Henry's painting. He went upstairs. He saw this in the, up there in the loft, and he grabbed it. He says, "I think I'll use that in the background of the painting that I'm working on." And then this one. There's another start. There's a problem of a, of a green glass, green bottle. Yeah, this has a lot more variety in it than the camera will pick up, that's for sure. And look at this beautiful halation coming off that edge there. Yep. Some people don't believe there's anything, such thing as a halation. They're all over the place. The whole damn planet's a halation with the sun hitting the surface of the earth and bouncing back into the space. <laughs> so, um, those are Glenn's studies. It's good, it, it, it's good to see where everybody started in all this. Right. The fundamentals of everything. Yep. I think Henry even said, you know, the whole point is... You spend your whole life trying to perfect the fundamentals. Yep. We also have a few of uh, Frank Morgan's studies from the school. Yep. Frank was, uh, I grew up with Frank in high school, and so we uh, studied at Malden Bridge together under Betty Warren and Richard Getz. And then Frank went one summer to Provincetown and studied with Henry. Here's a Provincetown start of his, a sunny day start, really strong. It's like uh, maybe geraniums or something in a flower pot with a white pan behind it. Good and strong. Um, and then we we painted in a studio that I had there in, where we lived in uh, one winter. And he, he did this, uh, I believe he worked on that once, a, a one-shot start, which is a damn good, a really good study. Good off notes, everything holds, the masses are well stated. You got a feeling of the indoor cloudy day light. Very, very well stated. And uh, this outdoor one is, seems uh, fairly I, I refined on his notes. I don't know if Frank did this. It almost was like Pat did that. Somebody did that. I don't know who did that, but it's you know, a, it's, I thought it was a good start. It's a little. Um, it's not heavy-handed enough to be Pat's. <laughs> Maybe Frank did this one, too. And then Frank did some house studies, because we'd go down around town, like down Fishburn Court, and um, see the way he's, he's simplified it into the big patterns, geometric shapes of just light and shade, light and shade, and getting the overall feeling of the key of the, of the day, the yeah, afternoon. Yeah, he, he, he pitched it up pretty high. He's got some beautiful notes. Yeah. The colors with no name. Gorgeous, beautifully related color areas. Strong, simple, but they read, but they're also subtle. It's a beautiful study. 
Yeah, um, it's like somebody likes to say, you know, a, a lot of people never got out of the over-colored stage or that raw-colored stage. Yeah. Well, it just shows you can get on up and get more refined and get more off, and it still appear very colored. Yep. Here's a bush, and he's got it into this simple color planes, big planes on the bush. That's what Henry wanted us to do in the beginning. If you're going to do a landscape, go out and do some houses or street scene, he called it. But mix the greenery in with some buildings. But just don't start off doing all greenery because it's overwhelming. Mix it in with something that's easily seen and can be easily studied. And then, and then play this off of this to get, the, to get the, the differences. And learn your color vocabulary of starting to mix different kinds of colors that you normally maybe wouldn't get in, in a still life or whatever but it all is all about learning what you're seeing and how to organize it in your mind